Good evening. Uh, welcome to this evening's Candidate Forum presented by The Bridge and Orca Media. I'm John Holler, this evening's moderator. This is the first in a series of forums that are sponsored by The Bridge and Orca Media that are intended to provide candidates with the opportunity to share their views and to make their case to voters as to why they should be elected. Tonight we have candidates running for Barry uh, Washington to House Legislative District, which has two seats. This is the first in a series of forums that will be, um, that will be held here. Now, before introducing the three candidates we have with us, I want to go over the format. So we've asked the public to uh, provide us with questions in advance, and we've used those in developing the questions that we're going to ask tonight. We'll also be taking calling questions. A volunteer uh, will write down those questions and pass them on to me. And we'll ask as many questions as we can fit in during the hour that we have allotted for this forum. Uh, candidates were not given the questions in advance. If you have a question that you'd like us to ask, please feel free to call in. It's 802-224-9901. Again, that number is 802-224-9901. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves, to explain why they're running, and to make opening remarks. After that, candidates will have a minute and a half to answer each question, and then at the end, each of them will have one minute to give a closing statement. I may make minor, minor adjustments as we go along, should those be needed. This isn't a debate, so the candidates won't be questioning each other. We have a timer in the studio that will help candidates keep track of how much time they have left for each of their comments. After the opening statements, I'll randomly vary the order that candidates are called on. Let me briefly introduce the candidates before turning it over to them to give an opening statement. So first uh, on the left here is Tom Kelly. Uh, Republican for Barry City. Uh, second in the middle here is Jonathan Williams, Democrat for Barry City. And on the right is uh, Peter Anthony, a Democrat for Barry City. There's a fourth candidate running, uh, Brian Judd, Republican for Barry City, who is not here this evening. Um, apparently chose not to be here. Um, So let me start uh, with the opening statements, and we'll start with the left. Uh, uh, Tom, do you want to lead us off here? Two minutes, please, for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Haller. <clears throat> I would like to begin um, in a different way by mentioning a topic that I believe has uh, not received balanced coverage in the Vermont media, Article 22 or Proposal 5, which, if passed, would add to the Vermont Constitution a right to, quote, personal reproductive autonomy. End quote. I have spoken to numerous Barry voters who were unaware and uninformed about this proposed addition to the Vermont Constitution. A free, unbiased press would challenge the proponents of the amendment with tough questions. It should not be ushered in without real debate. Sounds okay on the surface, but I would ask voters to take a closer look. We should avoid tinkering with our state's most permanent and hardest to change law when the proposal is one too extreme, two, too uncertain and vague, and three, unnecessary. Two, I'm going to go over these three uh, points very briefly. Two, extreme. The amendment would certainly, would most certainly enshrine the taking of innocent human life up to the moment of birth. Most Vermonters are not okay with that. Some I have spoken to did not know that that was currently the state of the law anyway. The amendment would forbid any effort to prevent late-term abortions. You should vote no because it's too extreme. The amendment does not mention the word, it's, it's also too vague. The amendment does not mention the word abortion, the word woman, or gender, or any age. This was intentional. They told us the courts will decide the meaning of personal reproductive autonomy in all contexts. We simply don't know where the clever lawyers and unelected judges will take this amendment. And finally, it's unnecessary. Title 18, Chapter 223 explicitly prohibits any legislation which would curb abortion. Even without any law in the books, there are zero restrictions or even regulations of abortions in Vermont. The statute that I just mentioned prevents the enactment of any restriction. You should vote no on this amendment because it is unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jonathan. Thank you, John, and thank my thanks to Orca and The Bridge for hosting us tonight. Uh, my name is Jonathan Williams, and I'm running to be your next Barry City State Representative. I'm running because I see every day how much <clears throat> Barry does for our surrounding communities 
and for Vermont. We are a diverse city, a city rich in history, a city filled with leaders. Uh, I work for the Vermont Food Bank, a berry organization, and so many of my coworkers and our volunteers all live and work in the city. Uh, you know, for years I've helped distribute food to people in need. And now more than ever before, so many of the resources and the leadership that the state requires is based right in Barry. Uh, you know, organizations like Capstone, CVABE, Downstreet, the Health and Wellness Center, and others, all headquartered where we live, work, and celebrate. But we need to, we need to change how the state works. We need to make it easier for Barry to lead the way. We need to make it easier for individuals and families who struggle with things like housing and hunger and homelessness and poor health and employment. Not just one-time aid, but sustained support for those businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities that are on the front lines every day helping our neighbors in need. Uh, I am originally from New Jersey. I moved to Vermont uh, to go to school after serving in the United States Peace Corps. Uh, and I have spent my entire adult life trying to make Vermont a better place for everyone, for all of our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Peter. Uh, thank you very much, John. And again, like my colleague, thank the uh, Bridge and Orca for the opportunity. Uh, I will be running for my third term. I, I have to say, as part of my opening statement, I was flabbergasted, thrilled, at the first two terms, there is no time in legislative history, I am told, where we had so much uncertainty, so much going on. Um, not only did we, um, because of COVID, uh, were unable to get out and campaign and meet with voters in 2020, but it happened to be time for the decennial reapportionment. We had a meltdown of the state employee's pension. Uh, we had a record number of vetoes by the chief executive, which, uh, needless to say, um, was disappointing to the majority of the legislature. In a couple of cases, we came um, within a couple of votes of um, uh, having, if you will, passed uh, child care bills, um, uh, medical leave bills, family leave bills. Uh, our, our down payment on essentially clean heat and climate change. And each of those were a disappointment. Uh, it was um, uh, including, I might add, the pension bill, which was uh, vetoed. That was one of the exceptions, overwhelmingly, that is to say unanimously <coughs> overridden by uh, both parties, members, uh, all 150 uh, members of the House. I come out of the tradition of a local government. And that's where I believe my strength is and my service to the city of Barrie, add to which my four years of experience already in the House. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Peter. All right, the first question is, um, is this, what is the most important legislative issue facing your district? And if you're elected, what would you do to address it? And the order of this in response uh, to this question will be, Peter, you'll be first. Tom, and then Jonathan. Uh, certainly housing in the city of Barrie, coupled with the grand list. Uh, as many people know, the city of Barrie is a full service community. Uh, the emergency services uh, consume uh, half and then some of the city budget, which does not leave a lot of wiggle room for us to invest in um, grant programs to improve the housing stock. Uh, unfortunately, there was an attempt by the legislature to take this statewide. Barry has already had a rental registry. We tried to do that statewide to take some of the pressure off uh, Barry and uh, older communities from people <clears throat> seeking housing. That failed. We are very proud we have a registry, but the amount of funds and um, allowable um, building lots in order to um, uh, apply those funds is very limited in an older community. So we will keep working at it, uh, but this is a very difficult uh, situation. A lot of existing housing has already been bought up by uh, people 
who actually have removed it from the, from the permanent housing market. And that is something we want to reverse, but it is not something that's regulatorily easy. Okay. Uh, thank you. Tom? Um, I would say um, the cost of living is, is a, an issue that uh, Barry voters are concerned about. And um, I must say, I'm not uh, entirely sure what the legislature can do about that. Um, the, um, we, we, um, one thing I could say, I, I believe the state has received an influx of, of COVID dollars. Um, I think the tax burden is, is a serious concern and has an impact on the cost of living. So I think we should do what we can do to uh, reduce the tax burden. And the reason I mentioned the COVID dollars is because uh, while they're there to be spent, uh, they should be spent on um, programs that, um, like, like infrastructure and uh, not new programming that will require additional funding. I also think the schools, uh, the funding of the schools uh, is, is a burden uh, to the community and um, the teacher-student um, uh, ratio uh, we, we should help our communities uh, reduce that. Um, the um, in, inflation is driven um, also by national policy, and I think what individuals can do is vote uh, with that in mind when they vote for, for po folks running for national office. Uh, Milton Friedman said inflation is made in Washington, and only Washington can create money, and, and any other attribution to inflation is, is wrong. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you, John. And I would echo the sentiments of my friend Peter that housing is the issue that I hear from folks again and again when I am uh, door knocking in Barry City. Uh, I think there are things that the legislature can do to make uh, it more affordable to live in Barry City, uh, both for renters and homeowners. Uh, we can certainly tweak Act 250 uh, to alleviate some of the requirements for downtown municipalities, um, uh, make it easier for new housing projects and developments to go up. Uh, I think we can tax corporations that are buying up a lot of the housing stock in Barrie. Barrie is blessed with uh, a significant amount of housing stock, uh, but it is a lot of it uh, older and needs an infusion of cash. Uh, and resources. Uh, uh, Tom was referring to the COVID monies. Those are ARPA dollars. Uh, my work at the food bank uh, is exclusively devoted to drawing down millions of uh, American Rescue Plan Act dollars for persons in need uh, to make sure that uh, those who struggle with hunger uh, have access to food. And I believe we can invest those monies uh, very smartly in our housing stock. Um, there's a number of things we can do. Restricting Airbnb uh, from operating in our municipalities um, such that uh, persons can still afford uh, the homes that they are. Uh, we have a right to have access to affordable housing in Barrie. And I think we can do quite a bit uh, to make that, uh, 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 to do some quick fixes to make things easier for folks. Thank you. The 2020 national um, presidential election and the um, uh, challenges to the legitimacy of the election have become a very divisive and ongoing issue nationally. But I want to ask you each as, uh, about your views about it, because I think that also has resulted in a lot of uh, questions about electoral uh, policies at the state level and likely to play out here in Vermont. So the question I have for each of you is whether you believe that President Biden was legitimately elected president in 2020. And if not, uh, to explain your position. And related to that, I'd ask you if you support the policy of providing mail-in ballots to all voters, which I believe everyone received in this past week. Uh, so for, in response to this question, we'll go with Tom first, uh, Jonathan, and then Peter. Um, in, in the midst of COVID, uh, there was an effort nationally to mail out ballots. Um, which may or may not have been necessary. But then on the heels of COVID, uh, the Vermont legislature um, enacted legislation which required for general elections everyone to get a ballot. I don't think that's wise policy, and, and I wish it could be reversed. Um, I don't know if the um, 
uh, legislature will be of such a mind to do that this uh, coming session, but I don't think uh, it's necessary for um, every person to get a ballot. I have no problem with um, um, ballots that would be uh, requested. Uh, absentee ballots are fine, but um, as far as the outcome of the election, um, I, I think there's legitimate questions about the election and, and what happened. Um, the um, the circumstantial evidence uh, uh, is is uh, quite persuasive that there were irregularities, um, and um, I think uh, a thinking person can question. Um, but the but the president of the United States is Mr. Biden, and uh, I respect that that's the way it is, um, and. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we should have um, a voting day instead of a voting season. People are getting their ballots uh, 40 days out uh, before they even really get a chance to dive into the... Now, I know they can keep them for, for long, but, but I, I think it's unwise policy to uh, provide the ballots that far from the election. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president of the United States. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, solid evidence at all to, to question that. Um, the Secretary of State's website in Vermont has a really great uh, page dedicated to combating misinformation. Uh, and they, even in Vermont, um, of any of the ballots called into question, uh, only one out of uh, 370,000 ballots cast uh, was uh, determined to be irregular. That's less than one one hundredth of one percent. Um, uh, voting fraud is not an issue in Vermont, nor do I believe it is an issue nationwide. Uh, I am all about uh, providing access to folks who need, who want to engage in our uh, civic life and our voting processes, but can't because they are homebound older adults, seniors, persons with disabilities. Um, I think it is very, very difficult to conduct voter fraud in Vermont, and there are so many steps that would need to, so many uh, 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 chances that would need to occur in order for a ballot to be miscast. Um, I think the ballots should be mailed out. I think folks should have every opportunity to register to vote and to vote uh, as, in as easy a way as they can. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Um, just to go back, uh, recap, your first question was, am I uh, convinced that President Biden was elected legitimately? The answer is yes. And uh, also, uh, do I think um, that uh, mail-in ballots uh, should continue to be uh, mailed? I do. I'd like to go back a little bit um, to people's memory. Uh, for those of you who forgot, uh, COVID struck in March of 2020. It was right on the heels of town meeting. Fortunately, that election had passed before uh, the uh, Vermont um, Commissioner of Public Health said, we have an emergency here. Uh, the legislature went to work and said, well, how are we going to proceed in 2020 with pr uh, primaries and the fall election? Answer, we're going to rearrange it so you do not have to go to your polling place. That was an act of public health necessity. The feedback I got was, gee, this is pretty neat. Uh, it's fine to request it, but what if I forget? But I really uh, cannot come that day. Too bad. Well, that's not right. Too bad is not an excuse. Uh, so I'm in favor of continuing the uh, mail ballots for all registered voters ahead of time. And I would remind everyone that there is actually a federal law that requires the Secretary of State to have ballots for the military out a certain number. It's 40 plus days. So that has to happen whether we want it in Vermont or not. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I wanted to move on to another topic, uh, and that is climate change. The effects of climate change are becoming increasingly apparent in Vermont and the rest of the world. Um, I don't believe there's any real scientific debate about the impact of climate change now or the effect of carbon emissions on climate. 
Vermont has taken a number of steps to address it, but I want to ask each of you whether you believe Vermont should take additional steps to uh, reduce carbon emissions in this state. And on this question, we'll start with Jonathan, uh, go to Peter, and then Tom. Um, thank you, John. Uh, I, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues here uh, tonight, I think I'm the only person under the age of 40 uh, running for this, uh, running for a house seat in Barry City. Um, I have faced the real threat of climate change my entire life growing up uh, from watching Captain Planet on Saturday morning cartoons uh, to serving as an environmental education volunteer uh, in the Peace Corps. Um, climate change is real. It is the single most critical, devastating uh, issue that we are called upon to, uh, to address as Vermonters, as Americans. Um, I think we have done quite a bit here in Vermont. I believe that we can do more. I believe that we can adopt the clean heat standard, which is not an increase on uh, those with low to moderate incomes uh, in expense. I think it makes things more affordable and lessens our dependence on foreign oil exports, which are subject to the volatility of world events like the war in Ukraine. Um, I think we need to make, make sure that uh, low-income Vermonters can afford things like heat pumps and uh, electric cars. And I think this issue uh, is a holistic one. It concerns uh, food security. It concerns economic security. Uh, it concerns our education standards. Uh, literally everything that we do uh, now moving forward until the end of my life must be directed at solving the climate crisis. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, John. <clears throat> um, I, I was, of course, present at the moment of the veto and failure to override the Clean Heat Standard Bill, and it was a, a great a blow. We, uh, we failed by one vote, as it happens. Really a tragedy. But let me go back to the wider, uh, if you will, issue. I was fortunate to attend one of the early rollout meetings by the Agency of Natural Resources talking about their strategy, which is already, if you will, adopted, codified, to attack transportation. For those folks who don't follow the debate, we're really talking about major contributors, a third, roughly, transportation, a third, home heating, and the other miscellaneous sources. The, we're well on our way with the Agency of Natural Resources uh, to literally get off of gasoline and diesel by 2035. That's great. What we failed to do, as my colleague has mentioned, is attack the home heating uh, com uh, contribution. That will return for sure. Uh, it is hoped that we will get some affirmative um, uh, suggestion, urging support from the administration. That was what was missing. We were flying blind in the legislature in the sense that the administration had not participated in that bill, and yet they vetoed it. So we'll be back. Stay tuned. And that's the section, that, the sector that really needs some attention right now. Tom. Thank you. Uh, proponents of the Global Warming <clears throat> Solutions Act have admitted candidly that Vermont cannot stop climate change. Um, in fact, Scott Campbell was quoted in a published article uh, in an email. Scott Campbell, a representative. No one, least of all me, believes Vermont can stop climate change. The Global Warming's, Warming Solutions Act will not mitigate climate change. So um, the governor was correct uh, in vetoing, and, and I'm happy to say it was, it was affirmed, the veto was, and I'm hoping to go to the legislature to support him in similar matters. Um, uh, we're we're uh, risking economic ruin uh, with no payoff. Um, and an Obama uh, uh, appointee and undersecretary uh, of the Department of, Edu of, of uh, Energy uh, wrote a book called Unsettled, referring to the science of climate change. He, and he, he wrote as follows. It's clear the media, politicians, and often the assessment reports themselves blatantly misrepresent what the science says about climate and catastrophes. Uh, science is never not open to debate. 
uh, it can be questioned, and there should be uh, a discussion about the underlying uh, causes of warming, but it's not an imminent catastrophe. Despite the media and political narrative, that's if, if my I, time's up. If I may respond to that, John. I'm going to give you a chance, uh, Jonathan. No, I, I don't, okay. because I, this is really not a debate, and he hasn't referenced you specifically. Fair so enough. if you'd like to throw that in and during your allotted time, that would be fine. Appreciate it. Um, all right, so I'm going to move back to housing. A couple of you, Peter and, and Jonathan, mentioned housing as a priority issue in, in Barry City. So I'm assuming that you do, when you did say, that you, that you supported um, the legislature doing more to promote housing development in Vermont. I want to talk a little bit more specifically about that. Often um, the it, housing issues have resulted in, um, in uh, debates between environmental community and the housing advocates and, and trade-offs. And I want to ask you if you would be willing, if you, well, two-part question, what specific measures would you support? Jonathan, you mentioned uh, better development in downtown areas. And the second would be, would you support those even in light of opposition from environmental organizations who in the past have said, have insisted on trade-offs, that is tightening Act 250 in, in some areas in exchange for loosening it in downtown areas, which I think has resulted in, not much, in nothing happening in terms of the, uh, the, the change, policy changes you're talking about. So what would your position be if it came down to that kind of a trade-off between promoting housing development in uh, urban areas uh, versus tightening it outside. I don't know if that's clear, but I'm trying to get at kind of how far and would you support those, those policies in the, in the face of opposition from the environmental community. All right, so on this one, Jonathan, you're going to go first, uh, Tom, and then Peter. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, you know, Barry City is a city in Vermont, and so we are quite urbanized relative to the rest of uh, our state, uh, and I think we can strike a balance between ensuring that we preserve the natural spaces that we all know and love. Uh, it's the height of foliage season right now. It's beautiful outside. Um, while welcoming those who want to move to Vermont, uh, you just spoke of. Uh, we all spoke of climate change. Uh, climate refugees is all are already a reality here, and it is going to get worse. Uh, the seasons change more rapidly. Uh, the, as we sit here and talk now, uh, a, a good portion of Florida is still underwater uh, due to a recent hurricane that was devastating in its effects. Um, so we need to strike a balance between providing for housing, uh, making things affordable for, for folks who live in Barry City, while also preserving the natural spaces like the cow pasture in Barry, where I walk my dogs. Um, I believe we can do it. We must do it. Um, we cannot change uh, the beauty that is Vermont. We cannot endanger uh, the wildlife that makes it such a wonderful place to live here. Uh, but we must prepare and must continue to address uh, an influx of persons who are seeking homes who want to live here. Uh, and that would better our economy simultaneously. Thank you. John, uh, I think it was, oh, was that? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, I think that's right. It was. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yep. Tom, yep. you're next. Okay. So I, I think the pendulum has swung so far in the last 50 years to the side of, uh, of uh, away from human flourishing here that I think we should take a look at some of the, the regulations. I think we can take care of our environment at the same time. Um, I also want to point out that the governor signed a bill passed by the legislature, actually two of them, S-226 and S-210, um, that um, called for reform uh, in, in, uh, of Act 250 and, in, and incentives to developers. Uh, I think we need to consult more with the private sector and identify how uh, the government um, may be getting in the way of the market meeting the need for housing. But um, I, And I think we should uh, uh, see how those two bills will uh, produce success in, in our state. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, John. Uh, for the city of Barrie, your, the question you posed, or the dilemma, I should say, is really, for me, a non-issue. And I say that because every single proposal uh, that involves Act 250, land use planning, uh, revisions uh, insisted upon 
uh, changes in density at the state level uh, have not offended Barry's pathway. We do have an approved plan. We have zoning. We have density requirements. We have complied with every revision that the legislature has insisted upon. Where your question uh, bites, if you will, and I concede it does, is the collision, frankly, with what we treasure as a landscape. It's farms, forests, living off the land, and the potential for uh, McMansions to arrive because the threat of the market uh, depends on people with lots of money. And there are people with lots of money who want to come to Vermont because it's unspoiled. And the question is, how far do you want the unspoiled to, if you will, displace what we have as our advantage in the, in the, in the name of tourism? And that is a real problem. And I certainly will try and strike a balance, but I am in no way going to Katie bar the door to the market. That's been the ruin of many a, res a resort uh, area that once was desirable precisely because it was aesthetically and physically and naturally attractive. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom uh, spoke uh, uh, pretty extensively in his opening comments about Article 22. That is a proposed amendment passed by the legislature, I believe, over two sessions to the Vermont Constitution that guarantees uh, individuals reproductive autonomy. I know Tom used to made uh, extensive comments about uh, your opposition to it, and I'll let you elaborate on this as well. I'd also like to get uh, the responses, views uh, from Jonathan and Peter as well. So on this one, we'll go with uh, Tom first, then Peter, and then Jonathan. Um, well, um, I, I feel real strongly about it um, that um, it's, it's at first really unnecessary. Um, we have a statute that prohibits, it was enacted in 2019, I believe, uh, that says the um, legislature and the executive branch and, and the judiciary shall not interfere with uh, abortion. And the word abortion is actually mentioned. Um, and so the only reason, the only way for that to go away would, would there, there'd have to be some legislation to uh, repeal it, and the governor would have to agree to that repeal, it would seem to me. Um, uh, I don't think that's likely, and even if that did go away, for there to be restrictions in Vermont, there would have to be affirmative legislation to impose such restrictions. My point is, if there was uh, no legislation on the books and no amendment, uh, which was true uh, uh, until 2019, there were no restrictions in, in Vermont at all on abortion. So it's, it's at first unnecessary. It also enshrines a right to an abortion up to the end of, of the term, which I think is so extreme and uh, frankly barbaric. Uh, and it's not a statement of values, which a constitution is, that Vermont holds. So I, I think uh, it's, it's wrong. Uh, to do this, and, and I'm hoping and praying that the people of Vermont uh, will, will say no to Article 22. Um, if they don't, our prayer to end abortion will continue. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, geez, I got thrown off a little bit because my chart here has four candidates and we only have three. Um, so we had Tom, uh, Peter, and then Jonathan. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I did preside in the Government Operations Committee with uh, extensive hearings uh, on both sides of the issue. Uh, it is true that, uh, by statute, uh, there is non-interference, if you will, in personal reproductive choices, including any and all um, chemical and uh, medical surgical tre treatments. However, uh, every year that I'm aware of, there have been five bills introduced in the legislature. And so it is not beyond uh, the realm of possibility uh, that that, um, if you will, repetitive uh, attack uh, on women's right to control the um, um, medical treatments that they elect to have or not have 
uh, is constantly under scrutiny. The um, value of the Constitution is that, frankly, a statute cannot trump it. And I'd go a little bit further. You probably are aware that there has been introduced in Congress a national attempt to statutorily uh, pave the way for regulation of abortion. I can tell you with uh, certain surety uh, that if the Vermont um, uh, protection of personal uh, medical treatment choice, including reproductive medical uh, treatment, is adopted, no federal statute can trump a Vermont Constitution article. And I support it. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, another. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Just about to skip, didn't sorry, to skip over you there, Jonathan. Sorry no about worries. that. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I echo the sentiments of, of my colleague and friend Peter. Um, I support uh, uh, Prop 5, Article 22. Uh, you know, the difficult decision to have an abortion should be exclusively the purview of an individual and their health care provider. Um, I do not think that uh, we should limit access to reproductive services or abortion care in this state. I think we need to be more proactive about providing protections to those seeking abortions. Uh, I am very grateful to have the endorsement of Planned Parenthood, and I wear it with a badge of honor. 70% um, of people in Vermont support uh, uh, Prop 5, Article 22. Um, it has gone through uh, two years in the legislature, an entire legislative biennium. Uh, it has been vetted uh, by Peter and many others. Um, you know, th there are no late-term abortions performed in Vermont uh, after uh, 22 weeks unless there is a danger to the individual carrying uh, the, the child, unless there is a, a real threat to their life. Um, and so, you know, when people talk about uh, late-term abortions, this fear of like late-term abortions, it's, it's a red herring. Uh, and we need to do our best to provide abortion care in Vermont for those, not just in Vermont here, but those seeking abortion uh, from other states where it has been uh, inappropriately uh, restricted uh, by those states' governments. Thank you. Thank you. So now I want to turn to another issue that might uh, generate just as much emotion in Vermont as abortion, and that is gun control. Do you believe the legislature should enact further regulations on the purchase of firearms, such as assault weapons, um, and elaborate on any views you have about that? And this time we're going to start with Jonathan, then to Tom, and then Peter. Uh, yes, I am in favor of an assault weapon ban. Uh, when it comes to gun reform, you know, I am fully supportive of Vermont sportsmen's Culture, uh, fishing and hunting is a way of life for many folks here, uh, but I don't think assault weapons need to play a part in that. Uh, they are far more deadly and uh, frightening and difficult to use than many other types of firearms. I also would like to see uh, the end to uh, online sales that exploit loopholes uh, for one-on-one uh, -on -one gun sales between an individual and a purchaser such that background checks don't need to be performed. Um, I think uh, you know, we can strike a balance between ensuring folks can continue to hunt and fish. I am a fisherman myself, though a very poor one, uh, and you know, preserving our way of life. What's interesting to me is that uh, hunting licenses have gone down over the years, but firearm purchases uh, have gone up. Uh, and that says to me that folks who uh, who value and uh, learn the proper use and storage of firearms, that, that valuable education is not being transmitted from generation to generation, and that concerns me. Thank you. Peter. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I, am, I, too, am against um, uh, open use and the value of uh, assault weapons. I cannot see... Uh, any purpose uh, other than in a military scenario, and that's not something I want to import into civilian life. I, I, like a lot of people, were crestfallen at the failure to have reformed, if you will, the waiting period so that there wasn't the default 
that if the report did not come back in a certain number of days, I believe it was six, um, uh, that the um, uh, permit to purchase would automatically uh, be uh, rendered. And that had tragic consequences both in uh, the Charlotte loophole, as it's come to be known, and also in the situation involving the student at Fairhaven. That was close. That was a very close call in the sense that it was not clear whether that student, as it turned out, could have purchased um, a firearm. We were, we were very fortunate that, in fact, the uh, report did come back in time, that that was prevented. But frankly, that loophole was part of a larger bill, which unfortunately was not adopted. And I will support returning to that. So the default is not someone who uh, can buy a firearm, but otherwise is frankly ineligible. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you. Um, I don't think we need more gun laws. Guns are not the problem. The people that use them are the problem. Um, the Second Amendment wasn't crafted to be sure we could have a good weekend hunting. Um, the governor, um, Governor Scott, actually uh, signed an initiative today, October 5th, uh, an executive order that uh, reconstituted the Violence Prevention Task Force. It's headed by Dee Barrick. Um, she was a uh, state, state police officer. She's uh, now known as the Director of Violence Prevention. She's been I think in that position since September. But among other things, this um, task force will identify needed reforms uh, of, of, of existing criminal justice laws, regulations, policies, and advocate for legislative and programmatic changes. Uh, I believe they're going to be looking at uh, school safety and other things along those lines. Um, so that's what I support. Let's take a look at what we need to do. But. Um, I, I don't think we need more gun laws. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It is, this is an issue that I think has had some discussion recently in Barry, and that is the question of racism in our communities in the state. Do you think the, the state legislature has a role in addressing the legacy of racism in Vermont and its ongoing impacts in this state and in its communities? Uh, this time we're going to go Peter, Jonathan, and Tom. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, yes, uh, again, in government oper operations, we heard uh, lots of testimony, uh, sad stories. They may be outliers, they may not be outliers. And the issue here is what is a person's redress, whether it's the con in the context of the workplace or school. Uh, I think the legislature has traditionally um, uh, treated uh, Vermont a, a little bit leniently in the sense that it has uh, assumed that we're all good folks and that doesn't happen here. Sadly, the testimony I heard says it does happen here and we uh, beefed up, if you will, with personnel and uh, funding the um, uh, diversity, um, uh, Office of Diversity at the state level as a resource for local folks. And that's, at the moment, the best we could do, if you will, with the support of the administration. But yes, I, I take it seriously. And yes, I have heard stories in Barry that uh, are very disturbing. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, systemic racism is uh, very real. Uh, uh, BIPOC individuals in Vermont are much more likely to be pulled over uh, black Americans are uh, three times more likely to then be searched by a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont. Uh, and this is something I can speak to with a great deal of confidence in my figures. Um, BIPOC individuals in Vermont are much more likely to be economically insecure and food insecure than, other, uh, than, than white Vermonters. Um, there is so much that we can do as communities in Barrie City and statewide to ensure that our neighbors who are in need, who are uh, suffering because of uh, institutions that were built or founded on racist principles, uh, uh, you know, we can do so much. And I've learned that we can do 
uh, so much more working at the Vermont Food Bank, where we <clears throat> go out of our way to uh, address those root causes of hunger and like economic insecurity, which BIPOC individuals in Vermont, refugees and migrants are much more likely to experience. Why not help our neighbors in need who are struggling because the system itself is unfair? Uh, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that our, our partners, our friends, our neighbors are welcomed and made to feel safe and respected in, in Barrie and uh, in the state. Thank you. Tom. Um, I think to some extent it's demeaning to suggest that um, people of different races are subject to systemic racism. It's so vague. Uh, I, I suggest that um, people viewing this video uh, check out um, two films uh, that Larry Elder has produced. Uh, one is called Uncle Tom and one is called Uncle Tom 2. And they make a very persuasive case that uh, systemic racism is uh, not real. And um, I just leave it at that. Take a look at those two films. Um, I haven't heard any persuasive uh, argument that there's uh, systemic racism in this state. I'd like to turn to the um, topic of economic development. Vermont has struggled at times to attract new investment to, to uh, grow jobs in this state. What uh, role would you play in the legislature in promoting economic development in your community or statewide? And uh, this time we're going to start with you, Tom, go to Peter, and then Jonathan. Well, I think I've alluded to, the, to this uh, a minute ago about the market. I think um, we should trust the market for things like uh, employment. So um, who would drive um, the um, creation of jobs? And I think we should look to employers and businesses and um, maybe try to find out why they aren't coming to this state. We need to improve the um, economic environment for businesses so that they come here and stay here. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, we all heard about the, uh, the $10,000 um, payment to entice people to come up here uh, to Vermont to work uh, from their homes. I think we need to do more to uh, bring real, uh, you know, blue collar jobs to uh, our communities, particularly Barrie City and Barrie Town, which would benefit Barrie City. So uh, I think that's what we need to do. And I would support any effort to, um, to work with uh, employers, whether they're in the state or out of the state. I think um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Duby had that as a mission one time when he was when he was Lieutenant Governor, and I think uh, I would encourage more of that to uh, create that uh, environment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, did you want? Peter oh, to go? did I? Well, let's see. I lost track. I'm sorry. You're right. It was uh, Tom and right. Peter. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, I, I have two observations. Um, I think we are um, far, far advantaged, superior in the area of specialty manufacturing. That's why we have roughly 10% uh, of our GDP is in manufacturing. And that has shrunk as uh, more traditional industries like granite uh, have uh, uh, declined, partly from imports. I think specialty manufacturing will and can expand. It has two constraints, which the legislature has started to work on. Workforce training. We have not created a bridge for people who do not go to college, who graduate from the Spalding High School or the Central Vermont Career Center. We have not created a, if you like, transition into apprenticeship programs workforce training programs, or community college that uh, weds, if you will, an associate degree with the trades, training in the trades. That's one constraint we're working on. The other constraint I've already talked about is housing. <laughs> you want to encourage uh, young people to stay here. Where are they going to make a down payment on an affordable house when they are fighting with student loans? They don't clearly have a career path, and they don't have an insurance of a job or a credential. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, may I may I respond? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, and Jonathan. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, this is this is my bread and butter. Uh, I love talking economic development. Uh, I think the state can do a lot more to support organizations like Barry Area Development and uh, the Barry Partnership. Uh, you know, uh, the Barry Partnership operates uh, uh, low uh, interest loans for businesses in in our city uh, for uh, to to purchase. Uh, facilities to pay rent, to make equipment purchases, uh, to pay salaries, that sort of thing. I think we could do a lot more to support those local economic development entities, chambers of commerce, the regional planning commissions uh, that are making it easier for uh, businesses to do business in Barrie and statewide. Uh, I think, you know, I, I as a town administrator have applied for uh, every alphabet soup government grant and loan under the sun for both the food bank and for municipalities that I've worked in across the state, uh, Pomfret, Callis, Essex Junction. Uh, we need to make it easier for businesses and nonprofits to tap into the money that is already there, those ARPA dollars that we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, it, it is a very unfortunate outcome that those wealthier communities uh, are, who have full-time staff, who have grant writers, are able again and again to draw down the resources uh, that they need to improve their downtowns. Whereas communities like Barrie that don't necessarily have the, the staffing or the bandwidth, uh, who are reliant on volunteers, are able to, uh, are struggling because we can't tap into those funds. The money is there. We just need to cut through the red tape. Thank okay. you, John. Thank you, Jonathan. This is Probably going to be our last question. So let's talk for a second about education. I know we're covering a lot of ground here, and it's going to be difficult to respond fully in a minute and a half. But I want to talk a little bit about both education spending and the way we raise money. We spend um, a very a lot of money in Vermont, uh, near the the top of all the states, at more than twenty thousand dollars per student. Do you th believe that we're getting a good return on our investment? And the second part of this question is: Do you think we need to change the way that we uh, fund education in this state. So the best you could do in, in a minute and a half, and, and we'll go on this one with uh, Jonathan. You'll be first, Peter, then Tom. Uh, a minute and a half to answer this question. <laughs> uh, yes, I do think there are fixes we can make. Uh, we need to um, tweak how uh, the monies travel from uh, are collected in the municipalities uh, and then doled out, uh, collected by the state and then doled out uh, to school systems. Uh, I think we can do a better job uh, in lowering costs per students uh, if we tweak that. Uh, this, it'll take much longer than the time I have remaining uh, to delve into that. I think we need to make sure that uh, we are paying teachers a thriving wage, not just uh, a minimum wage increase, but a thriving wage for our educators. My sister is an educator. Um, it, the job they have is enormous. Uh, and I think we could do a better job uh, recruiting and retaining educators, that'll cut down on cost as well. Uh, and I think we could do, uh, you know, even as the number of students de decreases across the state, I think we can cut down on costs. I'm very honored to have the uh, endorsement of the teachers unions uh, in Vermont and the higher education unions. Uh, and I believe that we can strike a balance between affordability uh, and accessibility for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I, I was privileged to be uh, one of the in the committee that heard the first report from the Uni uh, uh, University of Vermont education um, uh, team. Uh, essentially, say you, you the way you weight students. That is to say, uh, instead of simply uh, body count, we actually weight students according to their characteristics, and we formulate resource, um, if you will, availability based on those weights. Those weights existed uh, in a way which was irrational. Uh, the report said you cannot defend how they're um, apportioned out. Barry City, to be really uh, specific, was disadvantaged by the old weights. We finally, this, just this session, passed a, a bill out of the Education Committee, bless them, to transition to the new weights. Barry City will uh, be rewarded. Having said that, part of the 20,000 that you referred to is not only made up of uh, outliers, 
uh, which are not Barry City. Barry City, frankly, has, I think, the third lowest per pupil cost spending in the entire state. We're not the problem child. But having said that, the uh, real issue of why it's so big is uh, we are doing all kinds of things that otherwise health and human services might do after school, preschool, um, kindergarten, uh, things that were simply unheard of 20 years ago. That's eating up resources that are not traditionally part of the education budget. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'll be quick. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, no, I think three things. Uh, we should look at the uh, teacher-student ratio. It's, it's a very, I'm not sure if you say it's high or low, but it's, there's, there's um, I guess, low. There's, there's uh, I think, way too many teachers, and we need to take a look at that um, as, as they retire um, and, and leave service. Um, uh, we should take a look at the standardized tests and see how we're performing. Um, it's been a struggle sometimes to get straight answers to those questions. We also... Uh, should let the local community have more say in the budget. And I realize there's the uh, decision that, uh, the, the Supreme Court decision that, that impacted that tremendously. But um, I think there's some room to let the principle of subsidiarity take place in a lower, uh, a lower level, make some decisions about things like um, student-teacher ratio. And finally, I think what would help schools improve performance is expanding uh, school choice. Uh, let everyone, not just those in certain districts, I think that may be a constitutional requirement, by the way, given a recent decision by the US Supreme Court. Um, and while some legislators, I hope um, not Peter, um, have suggested that we would do away with our uh, school choice if religious schools were, rec uh, were one of the options, uh, um, that, that would be uh, very regrettable um, if, if uh, a legislator were to take such a position. But, uh, and I'm not saying he has, but I have heard that one did. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think um, uh, the vouchers should be expanded, and that would improve um, uh, all schools, I think, if, if people saw that uh, people could go elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. All right, it's time for uh, closing comments. We have one minute. We'll start, at, we'll do the reverse in the order that we started. So we'll start with Peter and then Jonathan and then uh, you, Tom. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I <coughs> want to serve a third term. I got a background in local government. I was privileged to be, if you will, baptism by fire over the last uh, two terms. Uh, there isn't an issue, including uh, school uh, changes in school funding, uh, property tax, workforce training, tax policy, you name it, it came across, if you will, my debate desk, and I'm happy to do that. I feel perfectly competent, and I'm always uh, open to suggestions from my local constituency. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Jonathan. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, it has been the greatest privilege of my life to uh, campaign for this office, to, to seek out uh, serving in the House of Representatives here in Vermont uh, to represent Barry City. Uh, it has been so fun going door to door, talking to people uh, from all walks of life, uh, to hear their stories, to hear not just uh, what issues they're concerned about, but to hear why they're proud to live in Barry City and why they love living in Vermont. Uh, I believe that I have the capabilities uh, to serve in the legislature. Uh, my background uh, from the time serving in the League of Cities and Towns as an advocate to working uh, in municipal governments across the state to now for the last half decade working for the Vermont Food Bank, helping my neighbors in need, uh, make sure that, that they have the food that they need. Um, I believe that I am ready and I believe that my skill set complements that of uh, my friend Peter's uh, and I am prepared to serve and I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. John, thank you. I want to say, too, that uh, thank you for this opportunity, by the way, to Orca and, uh, and the bridge, and to you, John. Um, I, I want to uh, agree with Jonathan that it's been, um, I'm surprised that it's actually been fun, the uh, campaigning, going door to door. I didn't think it would be, but meeting people, renewing acquaintances. Uh, I lived, I've lived in Barrie, called Barrie home since the mid-60s. Uh, there's three real reasons why I'm running. 
Uh, I want to bring a more conservative voice to Montpelier, uh, particularly after seeing some of the legislation um, uh, in the last few years, which we've talked about a little bit here today. Um, uh, friends and acquaintances asked me to run. That was another reason. And I think with my education and experience, I think I could contribute uh, as a legislator. Why, why do I think I'm qualified? My education includes a degree in government, uh, criminal justice from, from Norwich. I have a master's in human resource development from the University of Utah and a law degree from Notre Dame. I've served in the U.S. military, in the JAG Corps, uh, in the military police, a total of 29 years, um, five years of uh, active duty in Germany uh, and Kuwait, um, the rest with the Vermont Guard and other portions of the reserve forces. Um, after Tom, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Oh, I think I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then I, I, I served 30 years. Some, no. I'm sorry. 30 years as a prosecutor. And um, I think that all lends itself, if you will, of a life experience. Six children uh, lived in Barrie uh, to, to, to the job. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sorry for going over. No, that's fine. And thank you all for uh, the three of you for participating. You know, flourishing democracy requires that we have candidates who step up to run for public office and I greatly appreciate uh, the, the fact that each of you has, has do, chosen to do that, given the uh, Barry voters uh, a, a very a good choice of candidates, and so really appreciate your participation. Uh, democracy also requires that people vote. You should have received your ballot by now. If you haven't, contact your city clerk, but be sure to vote. Thank you again for your participation, and thank you to The Bridge and Orca Media for hosting this event.